are back at you with another talk. John Bosnich is back with us for some uh, Friday night adventures. <laughs> How are you doing, John? Good to have you back. Good. Not my not my uh, idea of a Friday night adventure generally, but okay. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I mean, we've got some topics that are going to be edgy, and you know, this is a comedy show, so it is going to be. Uh, Unpredictable. Let's put it that way. Considering all the topics that we've got uh, lined up to cover, um, let's get the disclaimers out the way. This is a comedy show. Nothing here has to do anything with reality. It is all parody and satire. <laughs> Any resemblance to reality is pure coincidence. And uh, let's dive right into the deep end. Since we last talked, um, conflict has broken out in Gaza. How do you feel about conflict in Gaza? First of all, there's a pretty solid uh, body of opinion among analysts that Israel had advanced knowledge of the Hamas attack. There's no proof been uh, presented yet, but uh, I think it's relatively reasonable to presume that Israel had some advanced information. They had the best intelligence service in the world, apparently. They had seven layers of defense, including laser and satellite supervision of the border along the Gaza area. It seems highly unlikely that, uh, that Hamas was able to plan this event for as much as two years in advance without any of the infiltrators, the spies, or the, the Egyptian, people that... The, the Egyptian army, I think, said that they uh, warned the Israelis like a year in advance <clears throat> or something like that, right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, and I, I think we, we have to at least consider the possibility that Israel knew of the attack, and we have to assess what the meaning of that, what the meaning of that knowledge actually is. Um, if you want to go the easy way, let's presume that Israel did not know about the attack. And, uh, and we, can, we can dissect that and then go to the more likely scenario that Israel's intelligence services at least knew about the attack and that we do know that they were warned by Egypt. Okay, so let's, let's, go, let's go the easy way, as you said. Let's see, let's see how, how you look at this whole thing taking into consideration that they didn't know. Okay, well, <clears throat> if, we, if we assess it from the perspective of the typical North American view that Israel did not know, they were caught off guard, Hamas scored an amazing victory with some modified hang gliders and, and a bulldozer. Um, are, you, are you a Trump supporter? Or are you calling Hamas intelligent? <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, I, you know, my support for Trump is based on the alternative. The alternative is so bad that Trump is the only reasonable candidate for American president, especially from the perspective of somebody who lives here in Serbia and who's a Serbian citizen and knows that Biden and his group are actually 100% anti-Serb. And Trump uh, can be said to be in the pocket of, of the Albanian lobby in the New York City area, and that unfortunately the Serbian efforts in America to reach out to him and educate him on this subject have failed. But given a choice, I'd, I'd be voting Trump 100 times before I even looked at Biden. Um, but to go back to the to the question about Israel, it seems that there's that there's uh, <clears throat> an immense degree of success on the part of Hamas if we say that they were able to conceal the planning for this attack for two years, that all of Israel's spies, and we know that Israel is very, very competent in the intelligence department, that all of Israel's spies inside the Hamas organization did not know of this attack. I think that's almost impossible. I think that we have the statement from Egypt that they warned Israel and there's proof of that statement. So Israel then would have had to not only not know of the attack, they'd have to reject the warning that they got from Egypt. And if they got a warning from Egypt, that means that the information is basically ready, readily available because Egypt is not 
known as an intelligence headquarters. So anyway, let's go down that road. So Israel, let's say, was caught completely off guard. <clears throat> okay, why did it take hours for Israel to properly respond to the attack? Why did the Israeli authorities not intervene in a manner that uh, protected the civilians more? Why did Israel not have proper response as it normally would to this attack? I think what happened here is we had a group of people out at a trans party, a rave party in the desert. Apparently, the rave party was not known of by the Hamas organizers. It certainly wasn't planned you, two years ago. So, did you know? The, did you know that the rave party was actually moved? Like the location of the party was moved like two days or the night before to like that fateful location yes. where the helicopters shot it up. I mean, where the Hamas people um, did stuff. Well, I think Hamas, that I think that you're. Your attempt to joke there has more more of a <clears throat> more of an edge on it than normal, and the fact is that when Israel overcompensated for its failure to to stop the attackers, um, the reports that are coming out now from people who were at the party and from people who are in the area, the the response is that Israeli helicopters just used. Uh, yeah, you say had, you say. It was like a overreaction, but I don't think so. I think it was like a planned, deliberate response. I think it was yeah, it was yeah. it was meant it, to it, cause, you know, it looks more like death. an overreaction. It looks like an overreaction, but we have to remember who the primary victims at the rave party were. These are the people who generally do not or try to avoid service in the Israeli military. These are the people who are, you know, in the drug subculture. These are the people who travel around the world for 10 to 15 years to avoid being drafted into the Israeli army. And these are the people that actually the Israeli army among Jews in Israel um, probably hates almost as much as they hate the Orthodox Jews who say that the state of Israel itself is illegal. So to put it in short, these people could be considered by some Jewish extremists, uh, Zionist extremists. I was just be, about to correct you. Yeah, yeah. Zionist yeah, extremists. Yeah. <laughs> Zionist extremists. These people could be considered to be expendable. And as expendable uh, cannon fodder, if they ended up being killed en masse by a response from Israel's armed forces, it would, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the dark side of this picture, the dark humor of this picture, if you want to call it humor, is that Israel might have seen an opportunity, the Zionist rulers of Israel might have seen an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. Have you heard of the Hannibal Directive? Yes, I have. And the Hannibal Directive is uh, an, an order in which the, and, and, and it's a, it was a standing order for some time in the Israeli military, which said that if a, uh, if a military post of Israel is overrun, or if Israelis are, are Israeli soldiers are taken captive, that there should be no quarter given to the other side, and that if it involves killing the hostage or the captured person, that's fine. And uh, there was a, a, an incident in, I think it was 2014, in which one Israeli soldier was captured, and uh, the response from Israel was to bomb the loco location where that soldier was. Uh, the soldier, of course, was killed, along with some hundred or more Palestinians. And so that directive is supposed to... It was invoked. The, the reason that I bring it up is it was evo evoked on, on, on that fateful day. Was it October yeah, 7? Yeah, we, is that the date? October 7? I don't want to be wrong. 7, yes. yeah. October 7. So we're now almost two months from the event. And uh, so the, the so-called Hannibal Directive is that we don't care about the hostages, we just kill the attackers. Mm -hmm. um, okay, it's a, it's a tactic. And uh, it's a tactic that, uh, that uh, is used to dissuade people from taking hostages because the actual answer is more than an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
the the Israeli approach uh, and the, and the and the Judaic religious approach was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Well, what we've got here is we've got at least ten eyes for one eye, and at least. 10 teeth for one teeth being extracted by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, um, which has killed has killed at least 10 times the number of people that the original attack from within the Gaza Strip claimed on the Israeli side. And we also and have to say... Thing. That Considering you're bringing all these numbers into, into it, um, everybody's touting, like, you know, the, how the Israelis uh, gave up all these prisoners... First of all, let's uh, bring attention to the fact that most of these prisoners are children, uh, yeah. as in like under the age of 18, and most of them were in pre-trial detention, not in actually sentence of anything, or if they were, they were sentence of attempted murder by throwing a rock. Um, right. They're, they're releasing... And at the they're same releasing... time... At the same time that these are being released, like 170 of them, or however many were before uh, on this Friday, the ceasefire broke down, um, which was to be expected, uh, they arrested the same amount of people in the West Bank, <laughs> which is like, you know... Um, it's, a, it's actually a, not a concession at all, it's a situation in which Israel just uh, swapped, basically swapped its hostages because the arrest of masses of Palestinians is obviously a threat hanging over the, the heads of every Palestinian parent, every Palestinian wife or husband who has a relative in detention in Israel. Yeah. Basically, what's happened here uh, to, to, to skirt around all the theories of who did what and who's guilty, this attack by Hamas has brought Israel back to the front in the in the news in the public in public affairs and uh, simultaneously the Israeli response has been so extreme and so harsh that 85% of the commentary in media around the world is anti-Israel so we've got a situation where Israel, if it allowed the attack, made a grievous error. If it didn't allow the attack, its response has been disproportionate and it's a violation of international humanitarian law and the rules of warfare. So if we had a world in which, uh, in which uh, justice was applied equally, we would see Netanyahu being named as a person of interest or who should be tried and who should be charged by the International Criminal Court. But of course, Israel does not recognize the International Criminal Court. Israel does not inter recognize the world court. Israel does not recognize even U.S. courts. So Israel is basically, and to use the word as, as it originally meant, an outlaw state outside a of the law. A rogue state. A rogue well, state, no, rogue, rogue, rogue is their term, but I mean the better term is outlaw. Outlaw means outside of the law, and Israel basically mm -hmm. outside of the law. Israel reserves the right to attack any nation. Israel has attacked and has killed uh, officials from other countries, notably uh, from Ir Iran, bombing Iran's nuclear power uh, facilities and killing one of Iran's most famous generals. So we have, a, we have a, a state which acts with impunity and which has, which has reacted, and I would say overreacted to the attack and and, and in the deeper background, remember, Hamas, financed by Israel, supported by Israel, and why? If, if you remember, think back, Israel wanted to support Hamas as a counterbalance to the PLO, which it said, which it was basically considering to be too strong an organization. So to divide and conquer the Arab-Palestinian population, then 
Israel encouraged the growth and building of Hamas. And if they did do that, it is certain that Israel could have injected its people inside Hamas and have a kind of deep throat source for information. That's why so many people think that Israel knew of this attack, that it allowed the attack to go forward in order to attempt the further ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from Israeli territory. Why they picked this time? Perhaps because the war in Ukraine was going so badly. It could have been an attempt by the United States and Israel to divert attention from their impending loss in Ukraine. Because after the loss and abject failure of the U.S. Russian propaganda, again well, with the Russian propaganda. Well, you know... <laughs> Uh, Ukraine is winning, man. They're sending pregnant yeah. women to the front. How, how is that not a sign of winning? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's uh, it's hard to respond to the charge <laughs> that you're a Russian propagandist when you say something uh, opposite to the lying MSM of the United States. Because basically, the most effective critics of the lying mainstream media of the United States are Russia, and specifically Russia's RT news service. And there are a few other news services around the world. Uh, I think we've mentioned that I've been on RT many, mm -hmm. many times, and yep. I've also been on Iranian press TV quite a few times. I would appear on Israeli television if they ever invited me, but I don't think they're too welcoming of critical mm -hmm. views, and my views are mm -hmm. critical of the way that Israel has conducted itself, not just now, but over the recent past. And its use of live ammunition against unarmed demonstrators has, has blackened Israel's name since long before this latest incident. Um, viewers, subscribers, you as well, might have heard of the Nakba. Yes. In 1948, the cleansing. And the numbers have been surpassed in the past uh, month and a half, two almost. Um, so there's that. What can I say? Did you see the footage of the hostages being released? Yes, and I saw the footage in which uh, some of the Israeli hostages thanked their captors. Yeah, yeah. And and waved to them and shook their hands and hugged them. So this is completely inconsistent with the Israeli narrative, the Israeli government narrative. And, uh, well, uh, it seems that uh, not only were the people who were in the party in the desert the kind of people who don't subscribe to the military policies of Israel, but they also are people who were taken hostage and were let's say not critical of the uh, of the palestinians who released them and they say that they were treated well by the palestinians mm -hmm. so i i think my my tendency would be to believe a hostage who said that they were treated well by the palestinians especially once they've been released and there's no reason to lie about the subject yeah. So this this really throws the standard we have to protect Israel narrative into disarray, and it raises questions that uh, actually can only be discussed on a on a podcast like yours because you can't get these discussions in a comedy the show, aligned mainstream media of the West. Comedy show, just like some that we're going to discuss later. And I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who supports me, as in the working brother, by buying me coffees and the Patreons as well. You guys are the regular supporters, and the buying the coffee is uh, always a nice surprise. Uh, somebody bought me a coffee the other day, and that motivated me to start going to hunt down the bank. So I might actually get some of your money one day. In any case, <laughs> Uh, let's move back to this whole uh, fiasco that's going on in uh, Gaza. And uh, this was forwarded to me by a conspiracy theorist. About two, three days after the whole Gaza episode. And uh, you mentioned it earlier. Look, this is a 2013 maybe episode, I guess, uh, edition. And if you right. look here, you can see Netanyahu on a paraglider. 
and Hamas paraglider. Interesting. You can also see the British journalists being <laughs> dumped into hell. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, this is some uh, conspiracy theory stuff for those of you who like conspiracy theories. And uh, very interesting, very interesting. Very I interesting mean, cover, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're being told that some of the footage that was released as Hamas footage was maybe uh, concocted footage that Israel released. We can't control oh, I heard that. Yeah. Uh, we can't control what might have been added or subtracted from the footage that was uh, taken from the bodies of the Hamas people. One has to wonder why there was so much footage from the attackers. That may have been not real footage. Um, I don't uh, no, know. I think if- that was real. I think the I think the footage was real. I mean, all this footage that I saw looked real and none, none, none of it looked staged. There and like I follow a lot of these military channels, which I'm sure would have like dis- deciphered or like dissected anything that that might have looked uh, suspicious. But um, I, I like when you say that, like maybe from your perspective, you're not used to it. But like you know, I remember the Houthis back in like you know 2014, maybe <laughs> they had GoPros shooting down fucking uh, <clears throat> Saudi tanks. You know what I mean? With like little ambushes right. and RPGs. So. Right. You know, for propaganda purposes, it's it's not something new. Right. But basically speaking, um, I think anybody who took part in the attack uh, would have to be called a suicide attacker. And the idea that a suicide attacker would take video that the other side would get their hands on doesn't make much sense. There was no returning from this attack. There was nobody making the attack and getting away. So why you would have so, so many? I think <clears throat> yeah. so. I think about, well, where did the hostages come from? Like half the where people, the, ha, the hostages, where did they come from? Half the half the attackers came back with hostages. Yes, that's true. But those attackers, look, I'm just suggesting that there's an more analyst, to it than, than appears at first glance. As an analyst, there appears to be too much visual material available from the attack. I know that there's a logical explanation that they took video and so on, but it appears to me that there's too much visual material available from the attack. The excuse given for the existence of that material is that Hamas was shooting um, propaganda videos while they made the attack. Mm -hmm. Doesn't ring true to me. They may have shot some, but I think there's more material than we should have expected there. It's just a a, a stubborn red light that goes on when I look at this. That's okay. We can't prove it either way. It'll take some time to know what happened. But uh, the idea that, attack, that an attack of this type could have been t- conducted and that the Israeli response was so delayed and that when the Israeli response happened, so many Israelis appear to have been killed by the Israeli forces. Things don't add up the way they should normally. That's, that's my, you know, I'm sitting here in Serbia. I'm not on the scene. I haven't been able to interview any of the victims or the survivors. You know, Um, if there have been uh, any, uh, any people that have been seen with cameras on rooftops, (laughs) Yeah, well, back to 9 11. That was a 9 11 joke if you missed it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> your, joke, your jokes have a, have, a, have a very high level of realism. But remember that the joke, that the joke on that subject was that apparently they, they, they were joking that they were Israeli intelligence officers. So uh-huh. once again, that might suggest that Israeli intelligence officers could have shot some video and maybe the video wasn't even at that time, that place or on that day. Doesn't matter. We can't prove it. But do you think there was actually a plane like considering we're we're touching on 9-11? Do you think there was actually a plane that hit the towers or was it something else? Like, have you Um, heard of the melted cars? Have you heard of the uh, melted cars? uh, No, I haven't. Tell me about it. No, that's too deep. We'll get uh, get into it off air. We'll get into it off air. But um, yeah, melted cars, everybody. 
Um, just like bubbles in space. In any case, let's uh, get into The Economist. Yes. Is Putin winning? <laughs> the Economist is asking, is Putin winning? And look at how they made Putin look evil inside yeah, Russia's well, war machine. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, The Economist is the... Oh, it's the Kremlin. You get it? Putin the, is the Kremlin. Yeah, yeah. Look, the, the Economist is the most blatant, hardcore, um, anti-Russian propaganda rag in the world. Number one, um, it's it's associated with the Rothschilds. It's a it's a kind of a personal publication of of the banking class. And uh, if you want to see uh, Putin with blood dripping from his fangs, you'll find that on the front page of the Economist. And uh, personally, I don't take the Economist seriously at all. I think the Economist is a like a uh, a madman screaming in the wind. But there are like people the out there. Like the son of of economics papers. <laughs> yeah, they they are the they are the hardcore Anglo imperialist newspaper, and uh, they they are. Uh, they're not a reliable source here. They're just a propaganda rag. So whatever The Economist turns out, if you do waste the time to read it, there might be a few tidbits in there that could be of some use, but it's uh, better to stay clear. I have to say that now the news world has greatly changed from when I started working as a journalist some 30 years ago. Um, and the interesting thing about this era is that more than ever before, I mean, in all the years since the Vietnam War till today, we've never seen such an, a preponderance of commentary opposed to the Anglo-American empire, opposed to Israel, opposed to the West's war in Ukraine, ever. Not even in the Vietnam War. It took years to get to the point where Walter Cronkite said we should withdraw, that this, is, this war is a mistake. But... If I, I'll just read the, I'll just read off some of the list here of what I've got. We've got Danny Haifong. We've got Scott Ritter. I've appeared on a on a on a program with Scott Ritter. We've got Jimmy Dore, a com a comedian who actually uses his show like you do to bring to light things that normally couldn't be aired except through comedy. Don't insult We've me. Got, yeah, well, Don't I, I, I respect the, I respect the <laughs> fact that you're getting these things out there and asking them. We yeah, got John but, but don't, got John don't put me on the same, me on an, the American, same an American professor people. emeritus who's clearly saying that the war in um, Ukraine is a fatal error on the part of the West, and who's now you're just already triggering me. Well, I, I might be triggering you, but this is uh, <laughs> if, if it, this is a comedy show, so if I trigger you to laugh, I guess that that uh, <laughs> that that might be useful. We've got Steve Bannon, we've got Peter Lavelle on RT, we've got George Galloway, we've got you know, we've got a listen, an listen, amazing. Listen. We've got we've got all of these names that you mentioned. We have them lined up because this is all like uh, scripted. Well, this part yeah. is anyway. Um, well, well, wait a minute. Just so just you before mentioned we go the Ritter. Other you mentioned Ritter. My subscribers yeah. will know that I've been trolling him for a while. And here he is. He's trolling Elon Musk, saying, it's trite as it may sound, I wish for world peace. This is Musk in fucking Israel with Netanyahu and his, like, mini vest. I don't know if you guys saw the pictures, but that was the smallest yeah. body armor vest that, that you can find. Um, yep. And then Ritter, who's never been in combat, says, no, you don't, and who has been to Russia but didn't bother to go down to Donbass, um, right. says, no, you don't. He's a train general. He's not an armchair general because he drives around in trains, and he gives his opinion about shit right. he hasn't seen. Um, you green-lighted Israel's mass murder in a conflict you know jack shit about, says Ritter. <laughs> so I ask Ritter, do you want to talk about it? Um... Ritter has not replied. Ritter is welcome right. on the show anytime. Um, but yeah, Ritter, I don't know, man. He's a he's a one 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 pony one uh, one song one uh, trick pony. Oh look, there's another meme. Uh, <clears throat> the British intelligence keeps reporting on the Russian dolphins in the Black Sea. So this is what the Russian dolphins in the Black Sea must look like. Um, the evil, in any case, evil Russian dolphins. 
You uh, mentioned also Mearsheimer. Where's my yeah. Mearsheimer I, thing? I don't have it here. I don't like Mearsheimer. I don't know. I don't right, understand. I, like he he's he's late to the party. Like everything he says is like old news, man. Well, remember, look at uh, I I met John Mearsheimer when I was working in Washington, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I have to say that uh, he impressed me. He was one of the first academics in America to... to when was this? What year? Um, so I was working in Washington in... Uh, nine, let me get this. Uh, in 2000 and... 2007. And uh, 2007... I was in Washington for about a year and a half, and I was working mm -hmm. there for the Serbian the Serbian Unity Congress, which actually turned out to be a CIA monitored front organization. So I had to uh, I had to bring it down, but I did accept the job there from Japan when I left Japan after the Fisher battle and my battles with the US government in Japan and with uh, and with the Japanese government um, I thought well I can either let them try to crush my activities in Japan or uh, and, and just go and hide under a rock somewhere or I can go straight to their headquarters and cause them trouble so I chose the latter being a you know I'll leave a link um, for that story up yeah, here. <laughs> But um, being a belligerent Serb, I thought, uh, well, you know, they come to Tokyo and they and they try to kidnap and 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 basically kill Bobby Fischer while I'm working as an advisor to the Japanese prime minister. And uh, I didn't take kindly to it. And as a Serb and as a chess player and as a at that time, somebody working for the best interests of Japan, I uh, I did everything I could to free Bobby. And we actually succeeded in getting him out of there. But uh um, we I have the whole the, expose, like it's an hour, maybe even like two hours that we recorded about it. I'll yeah, leave a link. So he, um, you can pop back and take a look at that. But uh, about so I, Mersheimer. I no, 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 no yeah. I'm not letting you go on. About okay, Mersheimer. Well, I'm going to go on to Mersheimer now because when I left Tokyo, I moved to Washington to work as an advisor to the Serbian Unity Congress, which I had some suspicions about, but I didn't realize how deep in the American CIA pocket they were. We but, also covered so this. I, there were Masons who took you around on a drive and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. So, so these things, they'd have to pop back to the other story. I'm not going to go through all the details. But all right. one of the main events while I was there in Washington was meeting John Mearsheimer in person. My late father knew him, and uh, John Mearsheimer was an academic from, I believe, the University of Chicago. And he came out with a book, which was uh, literally the kind of book that you would have never expected could get published in America. And that the title of the book was The Israel Lobby. And, and that, that book broke open the entire debate about who runs America, how they run it, and, and so on. And, uh, and, and of course, that book, The Israel Lobby, came out with one really, really important statistic. I mean, it's a whole book worth reading. But the key statistic is that Jewish Americans contribute 60% of the donations to the Democratic Party, and Jewish Americans contribute 40% of the financing for the Republican Party. So basically, both for both political parties in the United States, Jewish Americans are the number one donor. And in America, it's it's the joke is that it's the the greatest uh, democracy that money can buy. And American democracy is bought, and we're seeing now Biden Biden limited in what he can do with respect to the situation in. Israel and Israel's attack on Gaza. We see the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, being forced to travel to appear for a photo op with Israeli officials. We see Trump, uh, you know, 
uh, counting his chickens and and standing up for Israel. And we see very few people having the guts to come out and say that what Israel do is doing is a war crime. And it's not just a war crime by an organization like Hamas. It's a war okay. crime. I can't I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. You're praising Mearsheimer and in the same sentence you're saying people are not calling it a war crime and these are literal paraphrased quotes basically of of you know him being a third wave apologist for for fucking Israeli genocide. And yeah, okay, uh, so, so first I of all I don't know. I don't uh, know what let, to let, tell you, let, man. Let's let, all right, let's dissect it. Okay? Genocide means the killing side, herbicide, genocide, the killing of a genus, of, of a nation, of, a, of, of an identifiable uh, biological entity, a nation. Yes, but you don't have to complete it in order for it to be called a genocide. I know we that. I agree fact, on that. You, yeah. only have, <laughs> you only have to move under the UN new definition of genocide, you only have to forcibly move three people from their home to another location to be potentially charged with genocide. So three people, three, three. Huh. Okay. A group three. So For real, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, so the new definition of genocide has nothing to do with the definition of genocide to which uh, John Mearsheimer is referring, which is the old definition of genocide, which means a mass killing of a certain number of people that is so great that it threatens you know one to survive. Do you know one in 200 Gazans have been killed? Uh, no, 200 Gazans is not a genocide in my, in my no, no. mind. One in 200 have been killed. 0.5% yeah. uh, of not, Gazans not, have been killed. Yeah, I'm not talking in proportionality because if you talk in proportionality, then then we we don't we don't refer to Gazans as a nation. They are not a nation. There there's a Palestinian nation, and you'd have to take the number of killed as a percentage of the Palestinian nation. And obviously, it's a tiny percentage. So if you use it as a percentage of the of the group, it's not a genocide. And 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 so the old definition of a genocide. The one that we used when we referred to Adolf Hitler and the killing of Jews in World War II is a killing of such a sufficiently large number of people that it threatens the existence of that people on that territory. That has not happened in Israel. The number of people killed in Gaza, even if it's 13,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, does not it does not threaten the potential survival of 2.5 million people. I was gonna, okay. I was gonna time out. I was gonna leave this right. scum for the end. But considering you uh, you're calling it a not genocide and you're calling it not ethnic cleansing, basically, yeah. um, which and, and, I disagree and, and, with, and I yeah. and I don't want to get into semantics because you know, sure. like you can you can talk about international law and semantics and definitions, but then you can talk about realities. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a genocide. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a uh, fucking ethnic cleansing. And as far as I'm concerned, turning off the water and like telling everybody to move south where it's safe and then bombing the shit out of the south is uh, not cool, to put it lightly. And then you get videos like this. Watch this video and then tell me that yeah. these... You've seen this video? Yes. I'm going to turn it down. Yeah because it'll probably give me a copyright strike just for the video. But, like, yep. these are Israeli occupation forces yep. that have, quote-unquote, liberated Gaza and are showing them how to use uh, uh, toilets and then how to, like, throw their shit everywhere. And notice how they painted those uh, Stars of David everywhere. So, yep. yeah. And then they uh, mock locals. Um, right. I don't know, man. Um, Even it, the evil, crazy Russians don't do this. Even the, like, Ukrainian Nazis don't do this. I'm being right. sarcastic about the evil, crazy uh, Russians. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I just, I just want to say, under the current definition of genocide, 
that the UN has put forward and that it has applied in Bosnia and elsewhere. Then the three what people, is happening? The three people one? Yeah. Just a small identifiable group, identifiable mm -hmm. by their nation. Then this classifies as genocide. But I do not support that definition of genocide. I think that that definition of genocide makes any mass killing a genocide and it belittles the difference between a an actual genocide yeah. of a nation and a, a, a disproportionate illegal war crime of bombing civilians. That what is happening in Gaza is a war crime? Yes, 100%. It is a crime against humanity, the cutting off of water, fuel, and food, and the indiscriminate killing of women, children, and non-combatants is a war crime, no doubt about it. I don't want to waste your time or mine about the definition of genocide. I think the term is being used too lightly generally, and I think that by by diminishing the the severity of what we consider to be genocide, we're making genocide basically a common event. That's an excellent bombshell to end this first half of this talk. You said you would stick around. If you don't, my subscribers will be pissed. Um, everyone, thank you for sticking around. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll be back probably tomorrow in real time. <laughs>